Hello. Welcome to OV Healthy and the Physicians Health Network. We are a group of African-American and Black physicians that are here for two basic reasons. And welcome and, and thank you for joining us. Number one reason is that we would like to improve and try our best to improve the health of people of Africa. Number two is to encourage young Black males to go into medicine. Understand that we're, our webinar is every second Saturday at one o'clock. You can connect to this webinar by going to OB Healthy, the website, and hitting or clicking, I should say, Physicians Network, and come in and register and you can join our network and join the webinar. The thing of it is, is that you can type in your medical questions because we look forward to answering your medical questions. Alrighty, our prior webinars are on you uh, on YouTube, and you can access these webinars by going to OB Healthy and just the, the home screen and 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 scroll down to the base of that screen and hit the uh, YouTube sign. All of our prior YouTube webinars will come up. Enjoy them. Please subscribe as well so we can continue to bring the, uh, these webinars to you. Remember to type in your question. If you have a question, please type it in. And it can be any question as far as medicine is concerned. We will try to answer it to the best of our ability. Uh, I would like to thank OB Healthy for allowing us to use their platform so that we can bring this webinar to you. And the most important thing that I can say today, and I will say it several times, please do not change any aspect of your medical care before you, your physician, only your private doctor can truly take care of you as far as medical problems are concerned. All righty. First, let's get started. And we, what we will do is we'll introduce the physicians that are here today. Um, we're going to start with our physicians that are on the webinar at this particular point, but other physicians will be joining as the, as the uh, webinar goes on. We always appreciate, uh, are very appreciative of the time that they give, and sometimes they're stuck in the OR, stuck in the hospital, and they join us as, as they come available. All righty. We're going to start with Dr. Atherley. Dr. Atherley, please, can you introduce yourself? Good afternoon. I'm pleased to be a, again a part of this webinar. I'm Trevor Atherley. I'm an interventional cardiologist. I practice mainly in Essex County, and I'm located at North Beth Israel Medical Center, where I also serve as one of the teaching faculty for training of our cardiology fellows. Pleasure to be here. All righty, thank you. Dr. Court, please introduce. Dr. James Court, I practice in East Orange, New Jersey. My specialty is internal medicine, adult medicine only. All righty, thank you. And, uh, and uh, our special topic today is dentistry. And we have to cover this topic, we have Dr. Haniel Rosemont. And we are so pleased to have him with us today. You know, he's just been a part of our community here in, in Essex County for so, so many years and done so much with us. And we're just pleased to have him to go, oh, just expand on his specialty. Dr. Roseman, please, can you introduce yourself and tell us about yourself? Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. I've, I've been following this group for a while and very excited to be invited to participate today. My name is Dr. Hanyel Roseman. Practice in South Orange, New Jersey, been in Essex County probably 30 plus years. Um, we perform general dentistry in the office as well as have pediatric dentistry. All right, excellent, excellent. Well, you know what, <clears throat> what we're going to do is I just want to start off. And the way I look at this is we're going to put this in a frame of dental care for the Black community. All right, because our community, you know, I think it's just underserved as far as this is concerned, number one. And number two, there are certain fears out there. I know when I go to the dentist, I'm, I'm like shaking in my boots when I walk into the dentist because I know there is ultimately pain. Will be. <laughs> I'm, I'm coming in for pain. So um, I know, Dr. Rosemont, and you have a difficult job at times, but I'm going to let you start this off. I'm going to let you, you know, start us off and then Hopefully, we'll get a lot of questions from, from the people out there listening to the webinar so we can really, truly get some good education as far as our dental care as, as African-Americans. 
start it off for us. Tell All me right. about it. All right, well, let me start off with, with one of the basic things. People separate dental care and oral care from general health, but the, the, the mouth is a part of the body and a lot of the diseases, 90% of diseases have oral manifestations. So people shouldn't look at their oral health as separate from their general health. For instance, people that are diabetic, people that are hypertensive, those, those have oral manifestations as well as other things. So when you take certain medications for diabetes, hypertension, it, it, one of the things that can happen is it dehydrates the mouth. When it dehydrates the mouth, it leads to decay and several other oral issues. So I want people to view going to the dentist as they view seeing any other health provider, their cardiologists, their internal physicians, their pediatricians, you know, it should be a part of your regular health care. One of the things I'd like to talk about is when you just stated going to the dentist just for pain, I, 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 want, to, I want people to look at it as general preventive care in general. First of all, children as young as one should have their first dental visit. That's right, one year old. And the purpose of that visit is an opportunity to make sure that things are developing properly. There are no things such as tongue ties, that the home care being provided by, by the parents from a dietary standpoint is correct, how to properly clean the child's teeth at that point. At that age, the child should have a, a right size amount of toothpaste and the parent can use what they call a tooth wipe, uh, tooth wipe and actually just wipe out the child's mouth, even at one years of age. And they should go in and be assessed. A lot of people wait, but, but you should come in that early. Another big problem we have in our community is people let the child stay with a bottle too long mm. and sleep with the bottle. That leads to an issue we call milk bottle carriers. Once the child falls asleep, take the bottle out of their mouth. Never let a child sleep with a bottle in their mouth. The amount of decay that occurs can happen at a very rapid rate. So as soon as you see the child fall asleep, pull that bottle out of their mouth. Mm -hmm. um, let me see, I, I oh. also brush them, brush their teeth twice a day twice a day, morning and evening. Develop these habits early. Pacifier use. Try to eliminate pacifier use by one year old. It will affect the development of their jaws and teeth. It, it's, it's, there's quite a few things we've done in our community over the years that we said our parents did it, but we know better now. So it's, it's very important to get early assessment and intervention to catch things that are early stage. In terms of mothers, pregnant mothers, that's another thing that should be uh, assessed. I think our GYNs on board can attest to periodontal disease or gum disease is something that's very prominent in the community. Periodontal disease is a bacterial component that can can lead to cardiology issues, preterm low birth weight babies, and a lot of systemic diseases and overall body inflammation. So that is the primary reason why people need to get regular assessments, regular cleanings, um, come in and you know a minimum, sometimes we have patients come in four times a year, not just twice a year, four times a year to keep their, their tissues healthy. Mm -hmm. Always remember that's the first access to our, our oral cavity. So I always tell patients, it doesn't matter how healthy you eat, you eat organic food, you can have a vegan diet, whatever diet, if you're going through a bacterial field right before it enters your body, you're introducing bacterial organisms. That's how important it is to get regular mm -hmm. oral care. Right. So um, I'm just briefly touching on things. I'd rather just ask, answer questions as, as they come in. Right. Uh, there, I just want to reiterate though, the correlation with your oral health and, and general health. Mm -hmm. yeah, when you say periodontal, you mean the gums itself? So periodontal disease are, 
as we say, gum disease, or in the past, they've said pyorrhea. That's the number one reason why people lose their teeth. What happens is plaque fills up, turns to tartar, and that tartar leads to bone loss and gum loss and gum recession. Some of the things, the first sign of gum disease, by the way, is bleeding gums. Bleeding gums is not a healthy situation. That's the first indicator of an inflammatory process going on in your mouth. So if you see bleeding gums, it's not something to ignore. It's something to get assessed and, and uh, treated by, by a healthcare provider. Mm -hmm. um, gum disease progresses to the point where you can lose your, lose your teeth altogether. This process can be painless until the point where your teeth are starting to get loose. At that point, it's, it's pretty advanced and it does lead to other systemic problems. That's why we really, really urge patients to go get regular assessments. Don't wait for something to quote unquote hurt. Go in regularly, just like you go in and get, get your regular internal medicine exams, get your blood pressure checked, get, get EKGs. It's just as important to go in and get a regular uh, oral exam. Right. What about, I, I, there's a question that just came in and it says, does dental health have an effect on your gastrointestinal or your GI tract? Certainly can. I, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. So when people start to get their teeth taken out, God gave us our teeth for a reason, to masticate our food and to help in the digestive process. One of the first aspects of the digestive process is to chew and grind your food. So as you lose more teeth, you are putting more strain on your gastrointestinal system. People never correlate the two, but think about it. You're supposed to chew your food and grind your food before you start to swallow. So there is a correlation with uh, GI issues. All righty, excellent, excellent. And you know, uh, you, had talk, you had touched on something that from a pulmonary standpoint, and I know the other physicians will be chiming in, uh, from a pulmonary standpoint, there are medications that I use to prevent bronchial spasm that causes dry mouth. And I really never really realized until you started talking about it that dry mouth could cause dental problems. Expand on that just a little bit as far as dry mouth and, and what happens to the teeth because your mouth is dry? Sure, sure. Okay, well, saliva, your saliva is a part of your digestive process, but it, it has not only that component of helping to digest your food and swallow your food, it lubricates the teeth. So now, if you have a, a dry mouth situation related to a lot of medications that, that we take or just some systemic things going on, your mouth is not, your saliva is not lubricating your teeth. When your teeth aren't lubricated, they're more susceptible to decay mm -hmm. very, very rapidly. So if you have a high sugar diet, which I'll, I'll talk about diet in a minute too, that just brought up something, um, you are very susceptible to decay and it can, it can be very rapid. That's how critical it is that I recommend to patients that are on certain medications, if you feel dry, Get some water and and rinse <laughs> rinse around and lubricate your mouth. That's that's how important it is to protect your teeth because saliva is a protective uh, aspect of our system, and when it's decreased, it leads to other issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we got a lot of questions coming in. Uh, there's another question that says, "Good afternoon. Many people do not um, have dental insurance. As a senior retired um, NP." NP, um, we have to uh, pay for dental insurance as, uh, as Medicare does not cover. What options does a parent with several children, uh, you know, uh, provide this? So are there any, put it this way, how, how can you suggest um, for this particular problem? What do you suggest for this particular problem? That, that's a challenge in, in, in dentistry. Um, when Medicare and some of those services were developed, they did not think about the dental mm -hmm. community. Um, so some of, some, some of my colleagues, what, what we've done in our offices is provide, for lack of a better term, in-house plans that allows people an opportunity to get basic care, basic assessment. Uh, there's up, all, always the opportunity to visit some of the hospitals, the federally qualified health centers, have dental components. 
and they can be sometimes income based and provide some sliding fee scales. But that is a challenge in our profession. Right, right. I, I would I would suggest that in Essex County, we have Newark Community Health Center. Let's take down that name, Newark Community Health Center or NCHC. And they are, uh, that's our federally qualified health center in our area. And they offer excellent, excellent health care uh, and, and dental care to people who are you know, who can't afford to go to the dentist. And I would, I would seek out these, uh, these health centers uh, for proper dental care for your, for your children as well as all adults as well. All righty. Um, I know I'm covering some of the, some of the questions that, uh, as far as the physicians are concerned that are here. Do you have any questions for Dr. Rosemont at this time? Or I'll continue with some questions as far as your patients are concerned and how you, um, you know, some of the questions that they may have relating to dentistry. Mm -hmm. Well, I can say that I, I, I'm not sure if I'm taking a shot at the dentist, but I sometimes utilize um, the dental care in explaining some of the aspects to my patients. For example, uh, I often have to give local anesthetic to patients and then pass tubes from superficial areas into the heart for some of these specialized testing that we do. And I often utilize the example of the dentist and tell them that it's no more painful than going to the dentist. So I hate to <laughs> utilize you in that way, but um, we often have to, because everybody knows about the dentist and the pain. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me um, sort of introduce a topic for which I'm often called, uh, or I used to be called more often in the past actually, and that is the question of dental caries and the effect they may have on causing a disease in the heart called bacterial or infectious endocarditis. We've often been asked to help to prevent this dire disease from occurring when patients are going for dental work. And I know nowadays that we are much less stringent in terms of the need for preventative antibiotics, et cetera. But maybe I, I can ask the specific question of Haniel, and I, I probably can elaborate a little bit more on what I do, but the specific question in terms of how big a problem is it of releasing bacteria into the bloodstream, which can lodge on the heart and other um, vital areas when you do your dental work? What kind of dental procedures do we have to be concerned about that can you know, cause bacteria to go into the bloodstream? See, it, see, we have a tremendous correlation with cardiologists because of that reason. The mouth has a lot of bacteria. So dental caries, and particularly as we discussed earlier, periodontal disease, when we're treating these things, we're actually stimulating this bacteria in the patient's mouth. So when they have issues, certain murmurs, we require them, if, if they have a history of cardi, to get a cardiac clearance, actually, because the stimulation of the bacteria, as you know, can go after the heart, attack the heart and the valves and, and create an issue for you. So it's critical. It's a very important aspect of what we do to educate our patients to get cardiology follow-ups or even, even um, consultations and clearance before they get several dental, dental procedures. Depending on the degree of disease that, that's occurring in the patient's mouth, we, we require that. So there's a tremendous correlation between the bacteria in the mouth and, and cardio, mm -hmm. cardiac mm -hmm. issues, as well as kidney, as well as nephrology and other things. So um, it is something we, we educate our patients on how important it is. Mm -hmm. Yes, many, many of my patients mention uh, uh, that they've been referred to me because they have a heart murmur or have some sort of heart disease, and they're concerned that the dental uh, work that's being done could adversely affect the heart. So we've, we've studied that fairly carefully from the heart viewpoint, and things have changed. We've become a lot more conservative now. I think that the earlier edicts in terms of giving antibiotics to prevent infections from lodging in the heart they were much stricter in terms of the number of diseases that needed to have this kind of medication. Uh, say the early 2007, 2008 edicts from the American Heart Association suggested a broad variety of heart diseases. We have narrowed that down because studies have shown several things. One is that um, the amount of bacteria released at the time you do dental work, aggressive dental work, extractions or other aggressive dental work, and you may correct me if I'm uh, not clear on this, is not much more than, than with vigorous cleaning of the teeth. Right. So the patients are in fact exposed to bacteria going into the bloodstream day in, day out, and not only when they go to you. The other point is that in terms of the potential for infecting the heart, 
a lot of the diseases that we thought would be subject to infection, uh, valve diseases, people with heart murmurs, which represented leakage or narrowing of certain heart valves, we no longer consider important because studies have shown that they do not, in fact, become infected that easily from a visit to the dentist. And we've narrowed those diseases down quite considerably so that there are only a few circumstances in which I'm forced to give preventative antibiotics for patients who are going to have dental work. And I usually give medication to be taken 30 to 60 minutes before the dental work is performed. But they're really restricted now to diseases, some of the diseases, congenital heart diseases, diseases that patients may be born with, for example. A few of these are restricted to those who've had surgery, valvular replacements, and uh, people who've had not just full valve replacement, but may have had procedures which have left artificial material behind. One of the procedures that we do nowadays is clipping of one of the leaking valves called the mitral valve. We do mitral clipping, and we have to leave some prosthetic or artificial material in there. These patients are also a subject and are considered at high risk. So before, there was a designation of high, moderate, and low risk, and patients were treated a variety of risks. Now we only treat high-risk patients, patients who are considered at high risk for bacterial endocarditis. So thank goodness, I think we now have a little clearer understanding of this, and we use less and less of the antibiotic profentatively, prophylactically. The other point, of course, is that these, are, these medications can themselves cause side effects. So if you can avoid taking those medications, then do so. So fortunately, I still get the calls sometimes from dentists, but fortunately, I do not have to recommend antibiotics as frequently as I did years ago. Yeah, very good, very good. Uh, uh, Haniel, do you want to follow up on that? Or if not, then I'll introduce the two new physicians that have come on. No, I, I appreciate that. I, it, it, and it, and I learned something today, you know, uh, how they've decreased the number of things they pre-medicate for. So I, I appreciate that. We all learn. All righty. All right. Um, let me introduce the two physicians that have come on. Dr. Clark, could you um, unmute and introduce yourself, please? Hi, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Kevin Clark. I'm a surgical oncologist. I work in Newark with Israel. All righty. And good evening, Dr. Salam. Oh, good morning. Good morning, yeah. I should say, or good afternoon, Dr. Salam. I get it right one of these days. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Kareem Salam. I'm board certified in adult and child and adolescent psychiatry, and I work in uh, Northeast Philadelphia. Excellent. Excellent. Well, welcome, both of you. And we have a vigorous uh, discussion here about dentistry. Dr. Clark, you have, I mean, excuse Court. me, Dr. Clark, you have, a, you have a question. Yeah, two questions. For Dr. Roseman, what would be the most common cause of so-called bad breath and also for morning breath? Both of those could be related to what we discussed earlier about dry mouth, but the bacterial component too, of, it, there's an inflammatory process starting. So it's a bacterial process. Bad breath is not, Actually, it's not normal. People assume that that's a standard thing. You, you, there is an issue going on, whether it be dry mouth, whether a bacterial component, the release of uh, the bacteria releases gases, and that is the gases that you detect. And you know, as you know, as an internist, you know that sweet smell sometimes is an indicator of some diabetic issues, some other systemic things going on. So it's not a standard thing. If you have standard bad breath, there's an issue. In the morning, it could be indicative of them being a mouth breather, which can be an indicator of a sleep apnea issue. It's not something that just told you, oh, I wake up with morning breath. You know, if they're mouth breathing like that, you know, you guys would know better than me, the pulmonologist, the internist, it could be an indicator of, when I see patients now with that, I start to recommend them to get sleep studies. That's interesting. I never thought of that one. Alrighty. Maybe Dr. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Court. Maybe Dr. Salam can help me. Frequently, just like when Dr. Bay started this program, he alluded to the fact that you go to the dentist for pain. But we hear frequently that when the patient gets to the dentist, there's no pain. What's going on? Or what? Dr. Dr. Salam, I think I think he, I think he's asking you: Is it a psychological <laughs> problem, or is it <laughs> sounds like uh, anticipatory anxiety? So, uh, based on uh, previous experience, based on uh, popular culture, there's so many metaphors 
uh, of dentistry as it applies to an unpleasant experience. So uh, in anticipation of what society is generally referred to as an unpleasant experience, that could lead to anxiety. And, um, you know, the, the mouth is a highly innervated area and dental pain could be very excruciating. Those of us who've experienced it, and I belong to that fraternity, uh, it, it can be uh, debilitating because uh, of where the nerves are located uh, in the mouth. So uh, in the spirit of trying to avoid that unpleasant experience, uh, it could be uh, very anxiety provoking. Um, yeah. I hear you. I, I think I think I qualify for that now. <laughs> qualify 110. I'll just I, I'll just I, I just want to add something there. I agree 100. percent And I think that is one of the challenges, particularly in our community, that people have had negative dental experiences, which has led to avoidance and neglect, and which has led to further dental challenges. Mm -hmm. I I always tell people try to get a general exam try to find a compassionate provider that that listens to you and it is aware of our community you know in, in, in all aspects has been sometimes neglect and neglect leads to more issues i always, my goal is for patients to have a pleasant dental experience because things are caught early it's preventive in nature before it gets to a situation where where it's uncomfortable you know because what we're, we're human. If we experience an, uh, an uncomfortable experience, we tend to then avoid. And in our area, when you avoid problems, just get worse. So it really is important to go to somebody that's compassionate, that listens, and hopefully is gentle. <laughs> we, we have several questions more come, uh, and, and more coming up. Let me go to the next one. Uh, can you get dental? Uh, can you get dental cleaning, and or any type of dental work when pregnant, such as root canals or filling of cavities, or is it best to wait until after the delivery? You know, a lot of times with our pregnant patients, when it's early, uh, we recommend actually to get a good dental assessment. You know, just to see if we catch things so that they're not further along in 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 their terms. A lot of times, I will send the patient to their OBs be, to determine what type of pregnancy they're having. If they have a high risk pregnancy, we try to minimize their exposure, you know, to, to things that they can avoid to a later date. But I also like the fact that they get a good general cleaning and assessment ahead of time because hormonally during that process, the, the gums become more inflamed. Mothers are more susceptible to morning sickness, some other things. So it does create other dental issues. So I actually like to communicate with their OBs to see what the status of their uh, pregnancy is. And if they have a high risk, we may avoid certain procedures, but if they're having a normal traditional pregnancy, we will do most of our procedures. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Um, there's another question. Do tongue scraping actually work to control bacteria on the tongue and, and, and bad breath uh, or can, I just brushed my teeth, my tongue, excuse me. Can I just brush my tongue with a toothpaste and toothbrush? Both, both are, are good things to do. You do get bacterial buildup on your tongue and food particles. It does help in the overall cleansing process of the mouth. You don't necessarily need a tongue scraper. You can do it with your, with your uh, toothbrush. Mm -hmm. All right. You know, uh, also, I know that uh, in pulmonary, I use a lot of prednisone. And with prednisone, uh, there are certain bacteria that may be overgrown in the mouth. And it's usually a fungal organism called Canada. And it, you, it leaves a, a white film on the tongue. Sometimes it can get fairly significant for people with uh, their tongues can be very sore and raw. Do you find this or do you do you see this much and, and, and yes. what are your recommendations for patients like this? So, so we do see that a lot. That goes back to what I said earlier about medications and some of the oral manifestations. That get, get. So ster steroids, prednisone in particular, does can produce a situation sometimes called candida, 
or overgrowth of fungus, we do need to address that because that can become debilitating. It can be, it can, it's not attractive. It's also odor producing. It, patients can get sores. So we assess and sometimes we'll communicate with their healthcare provider. Is it possible they can adjust the dosage? One, two, we may, we, we may treat them with, with certain antifungal medications and some rinses and things like that. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. There's another question. How often should I, should I uh, go to the dentist? It states, miss the co uh, comment about regular visits. Can you restate that? I would say a minimum of twice a year, uh, but we have some patients that come in regularly as often as four, four times a year based on you know their dietary habits, how, how uh, plaque and tartar builds up on their teeth, but you should get an assessment at least twice a year. Twice a year. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Clark, um, you know, you with, uh, you know, surgery and, and cancer and how patients are more susceptible to uh, different illnesses during the episode of cancer or when it, things are aggressively or when your body is hypermetabolic and trying to fight things off. Do you find that dental, uh, dental um, you know, there are dental problems that you have to, you know, take care of prior to doing your surgeries? Um, I can't say it's it's that much different. I don't think they're more susceptible necessarily to, to dental problems. Um, overall, cancer patients are more mm -hmm. immunosuppressed um, just by virtue of, of having the cancer and probably being on treatment. But um, I can't say I've seen more more problems um, in those patients compared to other ones. Mm -hmm. All right. Or or when they do have problems, if it's more severe or not. I'm not sure it's, if it's any different. Okay. Dr. Rosemont, yes. Um, for us, one of our concerns is, particularly when patients have head and neck cancer, mm -hmm. and they, they get certain treatments via uh, radiation, it does create a challenge for us sometimes later on for surgical procedures, certain procedures, because we, one of them is like osteoradiation necrosis. Mm -hmm. So we were concerned that if patients have had previous radiation treatment in the head and neck region, it's a challenge for us. So much so that if we know patients going in for radiation therapy, we will tend to try to address all of their issues before, because it starts to compromise blood supply and it, it, it creates issues for us later. Mm -hmm. I have I have another question that's come through. Um, what about cancers of the of the mouth? Do you do you are there times when you actually see that or you identify it or you're the first yeah. one and and what do you do? Who do you refer them to after after it's identified or you think that that patient may have some either gum or oral cancer? So we 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 do see that, and when we do, we refer to uh, specialists, either oral surgeons, oral pathologists. General, um, usually on our side first, and they're addressed because that can be very prevalent based on people's habits, you know, chewing tobacco, smoking, things like that. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, there are other questions coming. We're getting a host of questions. This is so great. Um, do you recommend upgrading to an electric toothbrush over a manual toothbrush? <laughs> I personally like electric toothbrush, and I actually like them even more in the seniors that have compromised manual dexterity. I think they're great. The newer ones are amazing. They have timers on it to get people uh, a gauge on how long they should be brushing. So I like them. I like them. I like the rotary ones more. The, 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 they have been some that get a little bit gimmicky um, and talk about vibrating and everything else. I tend to like the rotary hand pieces better. Oh, Along right. the same line, the, the difference between something manual or or automatic, it's it's basically there's a process that should be standardized, right? So it doesn't matter if it's manual or electronic. What? How do you brush your teeth? I mean, what are you supposed to be doing? What's the what's the basic uh, standard? I mean, I, we all take it for granted, but basically, you brush your teeth. Basically, it's more like a, with a manual toothbrush, it's more a surgical cir circular movement right. at the gum line, and you should be sweeping away from the gum, not towards the gum. It's like our hairline, you know, mm. you back, it recedes. 
Right. It should be a circular movement and sweep away, circular movement, sweep away all the way around mm. you know, the facial side, the tongue side, and then brush the chewing surface. That's with the manual toothbrush. With an electric toothbrush, it's sort of the same thing. You're going around, because it's already rotary, it's just a matter of going around teeth from the facial side, then come back on the tongue side, and then do the chewing surface. Well, I, I have a question. Yes. Um, it seems like with age, there's a certain amount of erosion of the gums. How could you mitigate the risk of losing teeth in the wake of this process. So how could you prevent the, the recession? Yeah, I got you, Doc. The recession of the gums is usually indicative of when we discussed earlier before you came on, periodontal disease. Periodontal disease, one of the signs of periodontal disease is receding gums. Receding gums is not normal. There's something going on either mechanically because of the patient's brushing habits or systemically because of periodontal disease. So it's not the receding gums that cause them to lose their teeth. There's a process going on that's leading to the recession and the bone loss that's causing them to lose their teeth. And, you know, in our community in particular, there used to be a belief that as we aged, we automatically lost our teeth. That's not correct. That's just a matter of not getting in and getting regular assessments and regular cleaning and maintaining. I have bet several patients in their mid to late 80s that have all their teeth. So it's not it's not really correlated that age should mean that you should start losing your teeth. What about what about what about fluorination? And uh, that, and we're gonna talk about we're talk about the water that that uh, can you help us out as far as that's concerned, what, whether we should be fluorinating our teeth or not, or I personally am a believer. I know there's a lot of uh, communities that, that aren't big on fluoride. Fluoride is actually a natural element, right? You're not ingesting the fluoride. It's topical application of the fluoride, even in the young children in particular. A pea-sized amount of rubbing in with a, with a brush, the parents doing it, not leaving it up to the children, and having them spit out. Topical fluoride is one of the biggest things I recommend to the patients to reduce decay. Some communities have fluoridated water, some don't, but... Oh, I always educate the patients, it's topical application. It's not fully ingested. So it, it there, you know, but I, um, some people, you know, I'm not going to compromise people's belief, but in the dental community, fluoride is still a very important aspect of health care. Right. Okay. Um, there, I want to keep going with these questions. Uh, and there are some, quite a few Toothbrush question. So let and you may have answered this, but um, what type of toothbrush is better, round head or uh, rectangular head? Especially if one has crowned, hard to reach teeth. Okay, you just you just open up. Um, I one of the things is when you have hard to reach areas. I'm a big proponent of oral irrigators or water picks that flushes the hard to reach areas out, it will really, I, I consider it the power washer of the mouth. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, it, there's several brands, several devices, but I think it's a great supplement, particularly in the hard to reach areas. In terms of shape and size, sometimes it's, it, it's easier to get towards your back teeth with smaller head brushes. Always, and I always tell patients when they're reaching their posterior teeth in the back, don't open as wide as you can. Actually close a little bit because that would allow you access easier behind the last teeth. And I always say your goal is to brush behind the furthest tooth in the back. People have a tendency to brush to the side, but they don't get around that back tooth. And it's it's better with a smaller head to, uh, uh, brush. And I also say supplement things with the oral irrigator or some people say water pit. Mm -hmm. All righty. Another one of, uh, about toothbrush, <laughs> I think the toothbrush industry is getting a, uh, well, put it this way, is, electi is electric toothbrush better for the gums as far as gum health is concerned? I won't say it's better. Anything that removes plaque and keeps, it, keeps the gums clean is good for the gums. Mm -hmm. So people can be very diligent with 
with a manual toothbrush and do an excellent job. And that's, that's sufficient. It's just a matter of whichever process you use, get the plaque off the gums. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Next question. Let's face it, flossing is not fun. Is using a water pick or similar device sufficient? Actually, I like my patients to floss and use the oral irrigator. All righty, all righty. And that is because? Because what, what happens is when you're flossing, you're actually manually removing debris and particles and things like that, and then come behind it with the irrigator or the quote unquote power washer, and it just leaves a much cleaner, healthier uh, environment. All righty. Now, there's, there's, um, a question about yellowing teeth, and then we're going to go into some other questions, but why do my teeth yellow, and how can I prevent it? And number one, and it just seems unattractive to that particular person. What can they do about it? All right. Well, the, the shade of teeth has several, several factors. If it's yellowing and later it's a dietary, it could be a dietary component, a um, medication component, or or something along those lines, that creates surface stains, surface stain or plaque, plaque buildup, you know, maybe it's not sufficient removal of plaque and you will start to get staining of your teeth based on what you're eating. It's something to be assessed to see whether it's your home care and your technique or whether it's something dietary. Mm -hmm. If it is, that should usually be, uh, clear up with enhanced oral hygiene products and technique. There's also things that occur systemically, it, less now, but in the past, if, parent, if the mother of a, of a developing child took certain medications, that used to lead to certain intrinsic staining. That has to be addressed differently. That's more inside the tooth. But surface staining and yellowing, a lot of times that may be an indicator of, of getting you needing a dental assessment. Mm -hmm. I know, I know a lot of patients come and they complain as far as smoking is concerned and, and drinking coffee, you know, is that, uh, you know, do you get that question a lot and how do you, how do you, rec what do you recommend for those particular patients? So those two things are primary offenders of staining of teeth. If, uh, one, I try to get my patients to stop smoking, um, but it is a habit. And sometimes those are the patients that we may bring in four times a year instead of two times a year to get regular cleanings, just to address their staining issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, what are, and there's a question that just came in that says, tooth whitening techniques, best uh, and, and worst. <laughs> that's how they phrased it, best and worst. Uh, that, you know, that, that's an area that I think has gotten out of control. Mm -hmm. I think that, that people have let the media um, stimulate them to the point of, of I think too much is going on. I think that some of the products, they're peroxide-based products and they're being overused. I think if, you're, if you have an interest in whitening your teeth, you should get an assessment by a health professional to really see if it's needed or if it's not getting caught up into the media promotion of some of these products. Some of the products and how they're placed is a concern because they can irritate the gum tissues and create other issues. Mm -hmm. Um, so I am cautious in, in discussing, you know, utilization of tooth whitening products. Mm -hmm. All righty. Gotcha. Next question. Um, should flossing be done with each brushing? So you say twice a day, should they floss twice a day? Ideally, that should be part of your oral hygiene regimen. And then if you're in a position, if you've ate, eaten a meal and you feel something in there and you have the availability and time, it doesn't preclude you from going and flossing and getting that out right away rather than having to sit there all day. Mm -hmm. All righty. Next question, does brushing with baking soda, which that goes back many years with me, and, and uh, uh, a little salt harm the teeth? Uh, well, I'm gonna talk about salt because, um, you know, we have a lot of internists here and cardiologists here and that salt is, I'm, I'm anti-salt all the way. I've been trained by my, my physicians. So uh, salt is not needed at all in any way. And baking soda, again, that's an old, um, I'll say wives tale for lack of a better term. Baking soda is very abrasive. 
and we find it, that it, it's it's really too abrasive for the teeth. You don't need something that abrasive. It, you talk about irritating the gum tissues, irritating the tongue. So I, I'm not big on now. They may have some new over-the-counter products that have a little bit of baking soda, but baking soda as a straight product is not something I would recommend people brush with nowadays. Hmm. All righty, it's too Thank abrasive. You. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I got you. And I think we've answered this. Uh, the the last question here that is teeth whitening a health uh, a healthy process. That's uh, again, it, it, there's a lot of factors that go into it. That's not a, a one, one statement answer. I would say, if you're really interested in whitening your teeth, talk to one of your healthcare, uh, talk to your dentist. Mm -hmm. All right. Good, good. All righty. Oh, goodness. Another one just came in and I want to answer, I want to answer each one of these questions is, if we can. Do you recommend using a floss pick? And I think you had mentioned that, but can you restate it? Some of the devices I like, some of them I don't. When you say floss pick, they're different devices. My concern with some of the pointed devices is that the patients don't use them properly and they can actually intrude bacteria and food particles into the gum tissue, which can create an infection. So I'm not big on the pointed type products. I like more the, the irrigation type products or the rotary products that just brush things out, but the picks and sticks and pointy type appliances, I'm not a big proponent of. Now, I know that sometimes, uh, and I have some patients that have come in and were, were quite upset because they went to their dentist and the first thing their dentist stated that, that we have to pull that tooth. And then once you pull the tooth and you have a gap and you have, you have difficulty eating and stuff like that, is, is it is, is the goal of most dentists to save a tooth or to, you know, yeah, give me some idea because... Our, our goal should be to save the teeth. I mean, God gave us our teeth for a reason. We talked earlier about GI issues and a lot of times people don't relate the fact that they're having gastrointestinal issues because they've compromised their dentition. The goal is to save teeth. But at the same time, if they've gotten to the point of there's an infectious process either due to caries or periodontal disease, that's our goal to avoid getting to that point. Because at that point, sometimes it becomes, it can become a systemic issue and we, we may say we have to remove it. But the goal is to catch things early so we don't remove teeth. Don't remove, right, right. So, um, all righty, another question just came in. Is esophageal reflux the cause of bad breath? If so, how to minimize um, breath odor if that's the case? There, there are times when breath odor is actually coming from gastrointestinal issues. And then I would refer to my gastroenterologist colleagues and uh, for them to address that issue. Mm -hmm. Dr. Clark, I mean, Dr. Dr. Clark, do you, do you find that uh, with... Um, um, Esophageal reflux, patients with hiatal hernia, that reflux that they complain of, uh, you know, bad breath? No, not that many at all. Mm -hmm. Mainly some um, conditions that occur in the mouth rather right. than in the stomach. Okay, all right. I also have one question for the doctor. Mm -hmm. In yeah. terms of the use of antibiotics in children, at what age would certain antibiotics be safe to use and which one in terms of the effect on the tooth? Once, once the teeth are erupting, they can have certain antibiotics. It's the tetracyclines and things like that, that that we kind of gotten away from that. But in terms of amoxicillin and, and acillins, they can, they can have that in, in, in moderate doses at a fairly young age without it compromising the permanent dentition developing. Because the newer medications in the, in, Back in the day, for lack of a better term, tetracycline in, in mothers de with developing fetuses created, created issues. But, but with children that are already, you know, ambulatory and things like that, they can handle most uh, antibiotics. You mean like a three-year-old can uh, use tetracycline? We, that's not our first, you know, we, we lean more towards this amoxicillin. Tetracycline does have, have have the, uh, it still has that property where it can um, lead to staining. So I would stay away from tetracycline. 
Dr. Salam, yes. Yes, uh, this is a very rich discussion. Um, Dr. Roseman, could you speak to some of the benefits of, of mouthwash, if there are any, and when in your dental regimen or routine should you gargle? You can use, you can use mouthwash in your everyday dental routine. The one of the things about mouthwash that uh, I tell patients is I like alcohol free mouth rinses, you know, but you can rinse, you know, every time you go through your oral hygiene regimen, rinsing is fine. You know, you're irrigate. I like irrigating. It kind of gives you a little fresh thing. I just say uh, minimize uh, the alcohol mouth rinses because it can predispose you to oral cancer. So I just like alcohol free mouth rinses. Alrighty. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There's another question about, and I'll read this, uh, hopefully we get the understanding. In terms of getting tooth implants, does chewing pressure affect the, affect the bone? That's, what, that's how they stated it, so I'm not sure. Um, I really don't understand the question. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I'll, just, I'll just say this, with, with dental implants, uh, bone is critical. There, there needs to be a certain amount of bone to maintain and support the implant. There needs to be patients being diligent with their home care and certain habits like grinding and, and chewing very hard things like bones is not ideal for the implants. It's providing a stress that it's not uh, in, intended to take. All right. I, I so, think uh, so what you're saying is that once you have an implant, it may, it's not quite as strong as the original teeth? No, actually, the opposite. Implants, oh. when placed properly, are very strong. I mean, it does, you know, you still shouldn't chew certain things like bones and things like that. We all kind of have in our culture where we do some of these things, but it's not ideal because you're susceptible to fracture. Fracture in that case with an implant would be more in, in, in terms of the crown on top of it. Once an implant is fully integrated in the bone, it's it's just like a artificial knee, hip, or anything else. It's integrated. It's 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 in there. Okay, Roseman, you you talk about grinding. What causes that, or what? Why does that phenomenon occur? You know that that's constantly being studied. Um, one of the things they're starting to realize is it can also be an indicator of sleep apnea. Believe it or not. So you know, I, there's a stress component. There's a, a biomechanical component. Sometimes if their bite is off because of um, certain dental restorations that they had, and if it's not balanced, it can lead to grinding. It can just become a habitual thing. Um, so there's several factors that constantly studying, you know, what, what some of the etiologies are for grinding, but it is a deleterious habit that we need to try to correct because it can lead to a lot of uh, breakdown in the mouth. Dr. Rosman, if I can ask you a question. Um, in some societies, we see a significant proportion of children having dental caries or loss of teeth. Is that more dietary, active dietary uh, excesses of sweets, et cetera, et cetera, as the parents tell them? Or is it, in, in fact, malnutrition or some loss of appropriate dietary nutrients that they should have? It's usually a fact of uh, parents and grandparents not understanding um, the dietary problems that they, they're providing with the candies, with the sugars. Oh, that brings up a, 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 um, something for me. Xylitol is a sugar that is not deleterious to the teeth. So xylitol is in, um, I think, uh, what's the name of that gum? Five gum. If you're looking for a sugar that, that isn't as deleterious to the teeth, xylitol is the sugar to use. It actually has been starting, studies are starting to show that it actually has a carrier protective component to it. But when you see children with that, a lot of times it's related to sleeping with the bottle and even, even breastfeeding on demand can lead to ca carries, by the way. People would assume it's the bottle. It's not the bottle, it's the constant mm -hmm. sugar on the teeth and it will lead to the breakdown that you state, Dr. Apley. So it's really dietary, mm -hmm. cleaning the child's teeth before they go to bed, getting him into those habits early and um, just, dietary control but it's 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 not malnutrition it's just uh or oral care maybe lack of dental education and diet but not malnutrition 
You know, one, one thing um, that uh, I was, uh, I wanted to say in, in, in pulmonary, we worry about patients going to sleep with hard candy because of aspiration. But um, what about as far as dental is concerned? That's a big no-no. You know, I, I, you know, they, you should basically clean your mouth, brush your teeth, and rinse out before you go to bed. Because anything that sits overnight, that sugar turns to acid. That acid is working mm -hmm. all night long, and that's part of the process that leads to decay. That's mm -hmm. when you see children and you have a bunch of teeth. That's because they slept with the bottle. Their tongue does protect their airway, but that sugar is just sitting on their teeth all night long, and it's just mm -hmm. tearing up their teeth. So it's really, really important that to, to clean your teeth before you go to bed. Right, right. Um, the next uh, question is, can you please elaborate more on why alcohol-free mouthwash is better for you? Because constant exposure to alcohol, if you rinse it with alcohol every time, is constant exposure to your oral tissues to alcohol, which is not healthy, and it can predispose you to oral cancer. Mm -hmm. it, so you said oral cavities or cancer? Cancer. Oh, all righty. Some of the, they, you know, now, if you know, in, in the pharmacies and, and drugstores now, you see more and more alcohol-free um, products versus in the old days, for instance, the Listerine with that burn and from the phenol, they realize now that that wasn't good for constant exposure. So even right. Listerine has their alcohol-free components now. Okay. All righty. Um, okay, I want to I'm going to read this one, uh, and after this question, we're going to go to our our, our halftime break. Would you recommend straightening crooked teeth uh, if you are still able to floss, and if you are over sixty? If so, is uh, invasive? I think they want invasive uh, aligning as effective as uh, as metal braces. First of all, I, I recommend straightening teeth, and it's not always a cosmetic thing, it's a functional thing. Food traps and things like that, malalignment, malocclusion lead to functional issues, and your, your chewing efficiency, efficiency is always enhanced the straighter your teeth are. It's easier to clean, you have less food trapping. So yes, age is not a factor. We've had patients in their 70s going through orthodontic treatment or braces treatment. Now, to differentiate between traditional braces and Invisalign, that's a case-by-case -case thing and, and based on your, your particular situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, all righty. Um, Dr. Dr. Salam, there was a question that I, I, I had with grinding, um, and this may come in to your area as far as grinding your teeth. Do you find that psychological anxiety, those type of things, need patients to, you know, to be grinders as far as their teeth is concerned, especially during sleep or, or even awake mode? Uh, absolutely. Um, I think the clinical term is called bruxism. And um, it's believed to be linked to some neurotransmitter systems uh, in the brain, particularly dopamine. But the, the mechanism has not been fully worked out. Uh, and and there's no specific treatment. However, there, it has been noticed that some medications or, or compounds that increase dopamine in the brain could lead to bruxism. So stimulant medications that are used to treat ADHD, like Adderall or, or Vyvanse, those are amphetamine based uh, and they cause an increased release of dopamine in the brain, uh, which is believed be linked uh, to bruxism. Same for nicotine um, and medication uh, used to treat Parkinson's like levodopa. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but of course it could be a functional habit that may provide a sense of comfort to someone just like uh, folks who maybe when they were young, they would repeatedly rock or they would uh, gently tap their head against the soft pillow some of these repetitive behaviors uh, have been known to bring folks comfort. Obviously, there's a downside to bruxism where you could um, wear down the teeth and that can lead to dental problems. Right, right. 
All righty. Thank you. You know, I, you know, what I'd like to do at this particular point is just um, reintroduce our doctors and just state, you know, about the webinar. Um, remember that it's every second Saturday, every second Saturday at one o'clock. And please tell family and friends to tune in. Um, all you have to do is go to OB Healthy, hit the Physicians Network, and join. And we would love to answer your medical questions. I would like to also thank OB Healthy for allowing us to use their platform to bring this webinar to you. And again, the most important thing that I can say during this entire webinar is please do not change any aspect of your medical care or dental care, right? Uh, before you consult your physician or your healthcare provider or your dentist, all right? I would like to reintroduce um, our physicians. Dr. Atherley, can you in introduce yourself, please? I can. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Trevor Atherley, I'm an interventional cardiologist. My office is predominantly based at Newark Beth Israel Medical Center, where I'm also involved in the teaching of cardiology fellows. All righty, thank you. Dr. Court. Dr. James Court, I specialty is internal medicine. I only treat adults. I don't do any surgeries, neither do I deliver babies. <laughs> All right, don't deliver babies. I love that. <laughs> Dr. Haniel Rosemont. <laughs> Dr. Haniel Rosemont, I'm a general dentist. I'm in South Park, New Jersey, and I also don't deliver babies. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Kevin Clark, you're on mute, Kevin. Hey, good afternoon, Dr. Kevin Clark. I'm a surgical oncologist. Uh, I work in New York Beth Israel. Um, and yes, I don't deliver babies either. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Kareem Salam, brother. I also don't deliver babies. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a board certified adult and child and adolescent psychiatrist. And I'm the medical director of an adolescent unit in Northeast Philadelphia. Uh, and I don't know if it's, I don't know if this is a plug, but I'm someone who was, uh, I had dental crowding uh, as a youngster and I was always very self-conscious about that. And uh, in my late forties, almost 50 years old, I decided to have my teeth straightened and I went the route of Invisalign and it was, uh, it, I had a pretty significant case of dental crowding, uh, but I had an excellent orthodontist in the South Jersey area and we did the Invisalign and um, I'm very diligent about wearing my retainer. So it was a very, I, ha I had a very positive experience with Invisalign and I, I didn't think I would feel comfortable with the metal braces just in a professional environment. And I knew I would be more self-conscious, so. Now explain, explain Invisalign, what is that? Because I, I'm sure many people out there don't, you know, the term is great, but what happens? How, how does that, how does it work? So Invisalign is clear aligner therapy. So um, digital impressions or manual impressions are taken of the, taken of the mouth and it's actually computer generated aligners that will do micro moves of the teeth uh, either one week or every two weeks, you change your aligner and it creates the movement to get you into your ideal um, occlusal position versus the old traditional way where the brackets were bonded to the teeth, wires were attached and every, every month or so adjustments were made. It's, mm -hmm. it's progressed a long way. Obviously people tend to lean towards the aligner therapy for professional reasons particularly as well, as well as, I guess, comfort. Um, the traditional bra brackets, they're, one of the still advantages was they could move the teeth in a little more rapid fashion. But Invisalign has enhanced their techniques more and more, and, and they're, they're becoming equal in terms of how long the patients might have to go through that particular therapy. Excellent, excellent. All righty. There's a question that came in, can teeth be missing and the teeth being misaligned, can that cause ringing of the ears? I won't necessarily say they'll directly cause ringing of the ears, but if a patient had some issues and we could eliminate, we would just send them to the ENT, ear, nose and throat physician for an assessment. Um, the teeth missing and shifting can create some malalignment issues that create some functional stresses, but I can't directly say would always 
uh, lead to ring of the ears. I would definitely get a, a an assessment from an ear, nose, and throat to uh, investigate things further. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can missing teeth cause uh, TMJ disease? Yes, missing teeth could lead to TMJ disease, a temporal mandibular joint disease, because the malalignment now throws off your bite. When your bite gets thrown off, it can lead to certain joint issues, just like if, if our gait gets off, it can lead to back issues. So it's along those same lines. If the balance is thrown off, our body is designed to be balanced, you can develop uh, issues such mm -hmm. as the temporal mandibular joint. Yeah. And usually temporal mandibular joint disease is basically arthritis in that joint that, that allows us to open and close our mouth. Uh, just not only arthritis, just muscular, a muscular imbalance, mm -hmm. which can lead to arthritis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it is something to not ignore and get assessed, but it's not, it doesn't initially start out as an arthritic situation, more a muscular imbalance initially, which if caught early enough can be correct. Okay. All righty. Yeah. Another question, instead of CPAP machine, people have started using dental devices for obstructive sleep apnea. What is your opinion about, um, about this and others? I, I, I'm a big proponent of oral, oral appliances if the patients are CPAP intolerant, but that's partly a decision that's made in conjunction with their pulmonologist. Um, I, I think sleep apnea is, is an underdiagnosed uh, condition in our, in our, in our country. Um, and I believe that all sleep appliances have a place in the treatment of this malady. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I got you. The, the next question is using, is using a hydrogen peroxide mouthwash safe to use to help whitening your teeth? The, the peroxide product uh, mouthwash will have, a, you know, it can help with the surface staining. It's not going to help with any intrinsic staining, but it's also a product that I don't like patients to use on a regular basis because it does irritate the tissue, soft tissues. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, do, you, do you find that patients that are malnourished um, or patients that come in with uh, things like uh, anorexia or bulimia, vomiting, and that happens with, with our teenagers a lot, do you find that they have dental problems? Yes, they do. So a lot of times if people are in situations where they may um, regurgitate a lot, the acid, the stomach acid actually does start to wear on the enamel and show signs dentally as well as the oral tissue. So, and the lack of nutrition, the vitamin deficiency and everything else also show signs in their, their condition of their, their soft tissues as well. The color, mm -hmm. the, the turgor. So it, it's, yes, basically, yes. All righty, all righty. Uh, we're going to give you a break there for a minute, uh, Dr. Rosemont. Thanks. So many <laughs> questions. I mean, we're we're going at you there pretty hard, and I sure appreciate and all those answers. I understand. That there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there, and there's a lot of needed information out there. Mm -hmm. I guess the one thing I can say is don't avoid regular assessments. Right. You know, mm -hmm. get a, get regular assessments. I got you. Um, Dr. Dr. Atherley, uh, I, before we started, I alluded to a question that came up uh, and the person had asked about their, their heartbeat and when they're sleeping, they can hear their heartbeat in their ear, but they see, it seems as though, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, before they go to sleep, they're trying to go to sleep and they can hear their heartbeat in their ear and the heartbeat is irregular, they feel. Is this something that you've heard before or should they seek their cardiologist or primary care or should they be worried about that? It's an interesting question. I can't say I've heard that frequently. Um, people may be aware of the heartbeat, whether in the ears or in the chest, when laying down, because depending upon the position that you're laying, you may have the, the chest wall resting against the bed and you may then have that transmitted heart impulse heard if your ear is resting on the bed on the pillow nearby. So the, uh, the recognition of the heartbeat is something that you may do. And sometimes it may not represent any abnormality of the heart. 
However, irregular heartbeats, if this individual mentions an irregular heartbeat, that may be worthy of evaluation. Now, there are several different, uh, what we call arrhythmias, that can cause an irregularity of the heartbeat. One of the common ones will be uh, a beat that arises from an unusual location in the heart, we call them PVCs, which beats out of turn. And so while the heart is beating normally and regularly, along comes this irregular beat, the low turn, and the patient may become aware of this and the pause that follows it. So that's one kind. Another kind of irregular heartbeat, however, may be even more significant, and that is atrial fibrillation. This is the commonest arrhythmia seen in older patients, and it represents a total abnormality of the rhythm of the heart. The rhythm of the heart is usually generated from an electrical impulse that starts high up, called the sinus node. It goes all the way down to the ventricles or the powerful pumping chambers. And it follows a, a usually an orderly pathway to get from top to bottom and generates the muscular activity for the heartbeat. Sometimes, however, for a variety of different reasons, we may have irregularities emulating from and involving predominantly the atria, those thin wall, smaller chambers. And these irregularities or irregular heartbeats may be transmitted down to the powerful ones, which we can be much more aware of, ventricles. So patients may be aware of a palpitation, an irregularity of the heartbeat, a strange beating, skipping, or sometimes speeding up of the heartbeat. Since it is not easy to determine these merely from the statement that the patient makes, it is imperative that if the patient complains of this, that there should be a proper analysis. This may be done uh, by a physician uh, on just simple e examination, but more importantly, may be done by obtaining electrocardiograms. And sometimes we have to resort to long-term monitoring of the heart. We give patients some forms of monitoring devices which can be worn for variable periods of time. I commonly use either the one day one or the two week one. And patients wear these devices and they record every heartbeat during the time that they're on the patient. And we can later analyze these and see the character and the kind of irregular heartbeat that the patient has and make a decision as to whether or not specific treatment should be given. I will say that many times patients who are astute may be aware of a little irregular heartbeat here and there, and there may be no need to panic or to be overly concerned, but one should be should just be cognizant of these beats and have them properly checked by a physician. Excellent. Um, just, just recently, I had a patient that complained of the same thing of hearing the, their heartbeat in their ear. I looked into the ear and there was nothing there and I subsequently referred them to an ENT. And this wasn't like, like in the dead of night when it's quiet, this was during the daytime oh. where mm -hmm. there was no background, it was still background mm -hmm. noise. Mm -hmm. It could just be hyper-awareness. Yeah. Hmm? I don't, I'm sorry? It could just be hyper-awareness. I don't think it necessarily always indicates that there's a pathology there. Um, mm -hmm. It, you know, you just may be able to uh, to hear. It. You know, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. I don't think necessarily mm -hmm. it's uh, is pathologic. Um, I mean, as Dr. Athlete mentioned, there's you, know, you can go through a workup if it's an arrhythmia. Um, but most times, you realize even when you have an arrhythmia, you don't really, you can't tell. I mean, you may you may really tell that there's a flutter or there's you know you feel anxious, but in most cases, you have no idea what's going on. Sure. True. Many of our patients walk around with what we call arrhythmias or irregular heartbeats, and they're totally unaware of these. We detect them on our examinations, but many patients are unaware. There may be, I don't want to underestimate the significance of the single one-sided feeling in the ear, because there may be some structural abnormalities that could relate to the arteries there, for example, aneurysms of various arteries, et cetera, uh, that go up to the head and the, and the ear. And they may, these may be worthy of further evaluation. So if this is certainly something that the patient has been experiencing, especially over a prolonged period of time, I would suggest that you should get it properly evaluated just to rule okay. that unusual circumstance of there being a serious problem. Right. And it may In my not case, be, it was one-sided. It may not be a cardiac problem. It may be a, a hearing problem or mm -hmm. something related to that particular aspect. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. mm -hmm. Sure. There was another question, and this is Dr. Dr. Clark and Dr. Dr. Court and Dr. Clark may be able to chime in on this. Uh, I have um, really bad stomach pain after I eat. Uh, this started about uh, 
uh, one month uh, ago, no nausea, vomiting, but sometimes my BMs or my bowel movements are really dark. What do you think is going on with me? Dr. Um, Corey, you want to start or you want me to start? You can do it, but it it's probably means since there is pain followed by black bowel movement, the patient is obviously bleeding from the stomach because by the time the stool gets to the anus, it's oxidized and it turns, turns dark. So probably acute gastritis or a, a bleeding ulcer would be the most common uh, diagnosis in this case. Right, I think or, those, those two combinations, as Dr. Court mentioned, um, you're suspicious, you're suspicious for I think gastritis or an ulcer is pretty high. Um, and I think certainly an endoscopic evaluation is warranted um, in that situation. Abdominal pain is very, can be very big. There's a whole history and physical examination that you have to go through uh, to try to ascertain what the appropriate etiology is. So uh, patients who have acute, there's acute abdominal pain versus chronic. In the acute situation, um, you're worried about um, gastritis, active ulcer disease, perforation. All these things can also present in a chronic fashion. Um, important to see if there's weight loss or any other um, associated symptoms that may point to a malignancy. You know, in my work, I'm always thinking that somebody has a cancer. So it's one of the things we have to rule out to make sure that this is not an underlying cancer that's uh, causing these symptoms. But it's it's a full workup, including history and physical and an appropriate exam. But black black tarry stools is what is um, presented in stomach pain or epigastric pain. Um, it's most consistent with with some sort of bleeding from the upper GI tract, which is most commonly um, gastritis or an ulcer. Mm -hmm. What if it was what if it was red blood? Uh, you know, actually, red blood. Okay. instead of the black starry stools. Would your assessment be different or would you be thinking about other diseases? So if it's bright red blood um, coming from the rectum, then your your differential changes uh, quite a bit. It certainly can be from an upper source. If it's from an upper source, then it's a very um, fast um, upper GI bleed, uh, which can happen. Uh, patients tend to be uh, somewhat unstable in those situations. Mm -hmm. The most, um, if you look at uh, statistically, the most common cause of a lower GI bleed, and this is not uh, um, the heavy blood, but it's it's hemorrhoids. Um, so you tend to see just blood in in the bowl. That's the most common cause of, of bleeding. But certainly you have to rule out um, diverticular bleed uh, can cause uh, frank a brisk bleeding, um, and that's fairly common. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, something called angiodysplasia, which you can get in the colon, um, as well as inflammatory bowel disease, so ulcerative colitis, and other sort of inflammatory conditions can also cause bleeding. Again, it's um, you have to separate the patients out into: is this an acute, acute active process where um, intervention has to be done pretty quickly, or is this a chronic? Uh, intermittent process where you have more time to do a workup. But um, GI bleeding, upper GI bleeding, lower GI bleeding um, certainly is an algorithm to how we approach those patients right. um, involving both uh, the gastroenterologist, the surgeon, and an interventional radiologist. Right. Right. Again, don't, yeah. don't forget cancer in the rectal sigmoid. That's true. That's a cancer, right? That's not it, right? How can I forget, right? Uh, cancer is the other thing that can cause bleeding in, uh, in the GI tract, active, active bleeding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's go back to dental just for a second. Uh, you know, there are so many, well, I think in the African-American community, and, and I think most of the emphasis that we, um, well, put it this way, the, the people that we hope is listening to our webinar are of uh, African-American descent so we can give that education. Some of the barriers that our people may face as far as um, getting, de getting proper dental care or paying for proper dental care or, you know, 
what are some of the barriers that you see or or hear about, Dr. Rosemont, that we could, as a as a as a community, try to work on, and and so that we can deliver better care. Um, access to care is always a challenge, but I think we're in an area where the, there are providers available and institutions available, uh, such as federally qualified health centers, the, the dental schools. I think our biggest challenge as a community is misinformation. Mm -hmm. You know, pe people are, are looking at experiences or hearing experiences from previous eras and, and carrying those stories forward. Um, the, the belief that the only time you need to visit a, a healthcare, a, a dentist in particular, is if you have some discomfort. You know, we're trying to change that way of thinking and get people in a preventive mindset to catch things early, to get re regular uh, assessments. Uh, I would say that's our biggest challenge as a community. Misinformation based on history right. that's not necessarily accurate also, if people have had bad experiences in the past, it leads to them avoiding care. Dental care has come a long way. It is a lot more comfortable procedure in general. And I really encourage people to get regular assessments. Right. Right. You know, but I would say those are the two biggest challenges. I think there is access to care. I think it's just a matter of um, eliminating some of the previous uh, beliefs, you know, and, 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 and realizing how much more therapies and treatments are available now in terms of maintaining the teeth. That's another thing, not just taking teeth out, doing what they can to, you know, preserve and protect their, their dentition. Mm -hmm. So to try to keep their teeth, right. so I would say those two. Mm -hmm. What about, a, let's go back to um, our children again, because you opened up with that, but maybe a lot of people weren't on uh, at that particular point, because I think that's a, that's a very important area. Uh, can you talk about dental sealing for, for the kids oh. and, 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 and what, it, what it does for them and how important it is? So sealants is a procedure, believe it or not, not just for children. I now recommend them for our adult patients. The teeth have those natural grooves. And if based on patients' diet, dietary and anatomy, diet and anatomy, we sometimes recommend sealants to protect their teeth. It's a, it's a, for lack of a better term, a plastic coating that goes into the grooves of the teeth that decrease patient susceptibility to decay. Very, uh, mm -hmm. very highly recommended, particularly in, in patients that have a lot of grooves in their teeth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, all righty. And it, okay. And can you explain, and I've had one, so, <laughs> and I, I even need more explanation, a root canal. I mean, because you hear it all the time, it's like, why I need a root canal and right. what a root so, canal is and that type all right. of thing. So teeth basically have three layers, the enamel layer that you see, the dentin layer, and the third layer is the nerve or the pulp. Every tooth has those three layers. When the decay initially attacks a tooth, we try to catch it in the enamel and at the maximum, the dentin layer. At that point, you just need to get it basically cleaned out and, and filled with some restorative material. But if that decay and bacteria gets to the nerve or the pulp, it leads to pulpal death, infection, pain, and all of those seizures. At that point, in order to save the tooth and prevent tooth loss, we need to do a procedure called a root canal. And basically that's removing that dye, dyeing and infected tissue and infection that's producing the infection, cleaning out the bacteria and decay, and then sealing, sealing that chamber with a, a, a material that allows us to preserve the tooth. Now, at that point, you, the, that issue is addressed, but it's very important that the patients get a final restoration, a crown or an onlay of some sort to protect and preserve that tooth. Because one of the things that occurs, patients will get that procedure done, not get the tooth restored, and later on the tooth will continue to break down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. There's a question that just came in. Can one's regular dentist do deep cleaning or must one see a periodontist uh, to do the deep cleaning? 
you, you, your dentist provides procedures that they're able and trained to do. Um, if, if they've referred you to a periodontist, it may be beyond their scope of, of therapy and they will send you to a specialist or certain procedures can be performed by the general dentist. It's all based on uh, a healthcare provider's training. Mm -hmm. All um, Dr. Court, I have a pay, I have a question that came in about blood pressure, and they wanted to know what was the normal for blood pressure, and the number two is that the the um, the uh, the battery powered blood pressure ma uh, machines are they as accurate as uh, when you get it taken by your doctor and he doesn't use that type, he used the old old type of stethoscope in the blood pressure machine. Let me answer this second question first. I don't believe in those um, digital machines. They're not accurate. I've tried it. I've had the patients come in with, with their machine and I check the blood pressure first on one arm and then I use their machine. And this other arm, I use their machine first and then mine. There's always a discrepancy and significantly also. Sometimes as many, as much as 20 millimeter difference. I noticed that most of the hospitals, including the ones that most of us go to, all they're using are the digital machines. And you ask for a manual one, you can't get one. This could pose a problem to us because if the digital machines are not accurate, we could be liable because we could be treating something that really doesn't need to be treated. So. I detest, I don't like them, and I don't use them in my office. I use a, a manual machine. In reference to blood pressure, normally it would be 120 over 80, but as you age, your blood pressure tends to go up. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I tend to agree with, with Dr. Court, but I think that most people do not have the, the uh, familiarity with the court of songs uh, and detect appropriately this is the two components of the blood pressure as readily. So this has become a shortcut, I suppose. Um, but when properly done, I'm sure that when properly done by an appropriate auscultator, that the manual measurement of the blood pressure may be more accurate. It's more time consuming. Uh, in terms of the blood pressure, we have become a little bit stricter in terms of our definition of what is hypertension or high blood pressure. And we use lower numbers to define what is called high blood pressure. However, we're still not that clear or precise in terms of what number one should initiate treatment for patients and what number one should aim for to consider appropriate treatment or control of the blood pressure. In fact, a few of the newer studies have shown that levels that would normally be considered high blood pressure are now considered appropriate aims when treating high blood pressure in those over the age of 65. So in older patients, as Dr. Quart was alluding to, you may accept a higher pressure, may consider it more acceptable, and do not necessarily aim for the ideal or the very lowest pressures of 130 over less than 90. So we're accepting now pressures of 150 over 90 as appropriate in treating some elderly. The other point, of course, is that as we treat these patients too vigorously, we uh, introduce symptoms uh, things that the patients are aware of and feel that may make it uncomfortable for them to properly take their medications. So I kind of strike for a medium and do not go as strictly in the control of blood pressure as is sometimes stated. And just to follow up on that, Dr. Athlete, when you say that you accept um, this particular uh, level, um, that's based on what outcomes? The, the stroke risk, the heart, heart attack risk, what's the, what's the basis of the acceptance of a higher level? Good question. Uh, many of these studies more recently conducted looked at two things. Looked at the patient's ability to tolerate without simple uh, symptoms, without the, the development of pressures that drop, drop too low and cause symptoms, hypotension, dizziness and fainting, etc. cetera. Um, the ability to achieve a stable blood pressure. And in terms of the outcomes, they looked at the usual cardiac outcomes, heart attack, the combination of heart attacks, strokes, and of course the kidney failure, which follows as a consequence in many of us as a consequence of sustained elevated blood pressures. And they found that, especially in patients over the age of 65 in the more recent studies, that there was no significant improvement in their outcome when the blood pressure was brought down to less than 150. Now, in general, in patients under the age of 60, 
there still is the accepted aim of getting the blood pressure down by treatment down to the range of 140 or 90 or less. But in the older patients, we are kind of disinclined. We do not necessarily push um, for the achievement of the low blood pressure that might have been considered ideal for the younger because the benefit during that patient's more limited life lifespan, the benefit may be outweighed by the risk and the symptoms that we occur. Is it, is it secondary, Dr. Athlete, because our vessels are less compliant, that we, as an older person, we have the possibly higher blood pressure of systolic and we may have a, a larger, um, you know, uh, I, actually, yeah, a yeah, lar larger division yeah. between uh, the, the systolic and the diastolic? Yes, there are many factors that go together to, to contribute to the blood pressure, but one of them relates to the stiffness of the walls of the arteries. And as we age, the, ar the arteries become more atherosclerotic. There's more deposition of fatty substances in the walls, not just in the arteries of the heart that we, you know, we think about in heart attacks, but the arteries that go throughout the body. And so this, this contributes more to what is called the systolic hypertension, to the elevation of that first component. You know, when you're given your blood pressure is something over something. Well, the first component is called the systolic, and that may be a, a major contributor. And interestingly enough, that the, these walls may become rigid enough that the diastolic or the second component may be lower, allowing a bigger difference between the first component and the second component, okay? Mm -hmm. So rather than say 130 over 80, one may have a pressure of 180 over 60 that white pulse pressure may be observed a bit more in some of the elderly patients with hardening of the arteries. Mm -hmm. oh, all righty, all righty. Um, there's a, an insurance question or a payment question, uh, Dr. Rosemont. Uh, I found that my dentist was not giving me benefits from my insurance. What can I expect in terms of reimbursement or consideration of overpayment? So... I don't know, his dentist weren't, wasn't building his insurance and now? I'm not quite sure how, I, I don't know if I could answer that question. I'm not quite sure the whole situation. Right, right, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, uh, quick can, question. Can, go ahead. Um, Dr. Rosemont, just like, so in, in, uh, in medicine, when you turn 40, um, sometimes 45, uh, there's a whole bunch of screening things that, um, you're supposed to get. Is there any equivalent in, in dentistry? Are there certain things beyond just a regular checkup and screening that you would do at a particular age or in particular individuals? Um, if, in terms of adults, our assessment is pretty standard. Uh, we do evaluate, you know, periodontal status, bone status, how the bone structure is around their teeth. We, we do this procedure called periodontal charting to get keep a get a baseline with the new patient mm -hmm. and to monitor it over the years because periodontal disease is probably the number one disease that causes people to lose their teeth mm -hmm. we always assess our patients pretty much consistently the same way when there's been changes in their health i.e a diagnosis of cancer diagnosis of diabetes certain things we 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 may actually bring them in a little bit more regularly to monitor their mm -hmm. tissues but it's not really where we have different screenings based on age. It's more based on the patient's overall health history, but it's, it's pretty standard across the board. Okay, all righty, good, good. Another question, and uh, can one use soft picks and wooden toothpicks in addition to flossing as a supplement? How effective are they? Um, as I stated earlier, I'm not big on a lot of the pointed type uh, oral hygiene aids because if not used properly, you can actually push debris into the tissues and, and, and under the bone, into the bone and things like that. So I'm not big on that. I like the rotary instruments that are superficial and the irrigating devices, the picks and pointed type devices, I'm not big on. I just floss, irrigate, brush. Gotcha, gotcha. And what about if there's a question that came in about sensitive teeth, uh, trying to eat and my teeth are sensitive. Um, not that I feel like I have a toothache or anything, but I, I can't tolerate hot and cold very easily. Um, what about that? Yeah, can a, we help that person? That, that's a common challenge. 
and you should actually be, we do have different um, solutions and, and, and treatments for sensitive teeth. Um, initially, you could start out by using some of the products such as Sensodyne toothpaste, Pronamel toothpaste, but hot and cold sensitivity from a generalized standpoint is, is a common uh, complaint from patients and we do, you know, try to evaluate what the etiology is to get them in a more comfortable state. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, thank you. Dr. Dr. Clark, um, there was a question that came through about um, the patient uh, and his family member has uh, a, a pancreatic cancer and they wanted to know uh, some of the most common number one causes and, and, and how to diagnose it, if, it, if it's possible to diagnose early. And, and are there any treatments that are effective? So unfortunately, um, it's not one of the cancers where we have a good screening tool. Um, typically it's picked up only when it's symptomatic and the symptomatology usually involves uh, sudden onset or recent onset jaundice or yellowing of the skin um, or abdominal pain. Unfortunately, that's the most common presentation. Um, now, we have made some progress in that there are certain family members, if we know that there's a family history, there are certain things that we can screen for. There's a genetic mutations that we can screen families for that we know predisposes to development of pancreatic cancer. Actually, one of which interestingly is uh, the BRCA mutation. So BRCA mutations, in addition to breast and ovarian cancer, uh, there is an increased risk of pancreatic cancer in those families. There are other mutations that we screen for. Again, they're not that common. Um, and this probably represents a small percentage of the patients who get pancreatic cancer. For the most part, um, we don't have an effective screening. So it's, it's uh, if, if there's an abnormality in terms of if you have abdominal pain or anything that's um, out of the ordinary. Um, and again, hopefully you're getting regular physical examinations with your primary care doctor. Um, hopefully uh, this can be picked up or something can be picked up earlier. But it's one of, uh, again, the blind spots that we have in terms of the cancers that we treat. We can't really detect it early. And as a result, most cases tend to present advanced or metastatic. Mm -hmm. And even the ones, unfortunately, that uh, present what we call relatively early, um, we end up doing a very big operation called a Whipple procedure. Um, where we take out part of the pancreas, um, the stomach, the bile duct, and the uh, duodenum and reconstruct it. Um, and even in those cases, when we're successful removing everything, um, patients still recur. So the, the five-year survival or overall survival, even in cases where we think are curative, um, is still pretty low. So it's, it's one of the cancers where we have lots of room to for improvement, um, both in terms of um, identification of high-risk uh, patients, screening, um, and also treatment. Surgery itself hasn't changed that much. We've, we've um, extended to some degree some of the types of procedures we're doing, but that hasn't really moved the needle in terms of outcomes. Um, chemotherapy, we're somewhat getting there a little bit better. Um, certainly we're giving patients more and more toxic, uh, treatments. Um, if they survive the toxic treatments, they actually do okay, but they have to survive the toxic treatments. Um, but yeah, we still have plenty of room in pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I have to I'm agree sorry. with, Go ahead. in Go terms ahead, of uh, pancreatic cancer, I have had an experience where there were six siblings, two in New Jersey had pancreatic cancer and two in Florida had pancreatic cancer. So there, there must be some kind of genetic component to this. Mm -hmm. the, the two in New Jersey, one was a male and the other one was a female. And the two in Florida were females. Mm -hmm. And you commented, Kevin, have you seen this or in just? Yeah, well, so it, 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 it certainly probably would represent, um, it sounds like they probably have a heritage the, the heritable mutation. So they'd have to see the genetic uh, counselor to see what particular mutation that is. The, the risk of what you're, in identifying these mutations, what happens is you have a, a um, risk assessment of your, your um, uh, risk of developing a cancer, right? So 
what you want to do is uh, in when we screen, we ask the family history. If family history is appropriate, you screen patients who do not have the disease who are at higher risk for the mutation. If they have the mutation, then we can predict within reason what their risk of developing cancer in the future is. And based on that, we offer them what we call prophylactic treatment. Now, um, again, in pancreatic cancer, it's a little bit, we're not as advanced as say in breast cancer, where we know if you have a BRCA mutation, you have a lifetime risk of 60 to 80%. So you can get a prophylactic mastectomy. We're not quite there either pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, if you have an, an FAP mutation where you tend to develop polyps, we can tell you yes. Uh, by age 20, 25, you should have a total colectomy. Um, we're still in a process of developing that in pancreatic cancer. And the, thing, the, the tricky thing is um, it's, it's not just one area of the pancreas, it's, it's the entire pancreas. So the procedure is pretty morbid that you're gonna be offering as a prophylactic procedure. So we have to be pretty, pretty sure um, that we have good evidence of what's going to happen um, to, to offer something prophylactic. And the flip side also um, is that if you can prevent pancreatic cancer, that, as I mentioned before, um, our therapy is not that effective. So uh, we're, still, we're still in the early phase, but whenever we see that history, something's there. It's not, it's not something to, to ignore. It's just a matter of delineating specifically what mutation it is in trying to figure out what the percentage um, or risk is so we can up, offer the appropriate therapy. Oh, excellent. Do you generally check the patients to see if a patient is new with pancreatic cancer, do you study them to see if they have a mutation or not? Not usually, not outside, uh, not unless there's in a pretty specific family history. So what I would ask, so any, any, um, pancreatic cancer patient, you ask about breast cancer history because a BRCA mutation is fairly common. Um, but specifically for checking for um, mutations for pancreatic cancer itself, um, not usually. Because uh, again, in most, most patients who get pancreatic cancer, it's going to be what we call sporadic. So it's not going to be because they, because they have a heritable uh, mutation. Excellent. All right, we, we have uh, Dr. James Lee. Can you unmute yourself? <laughs> uh, Dr. Lee, can you introduce yourself? Let's, uh, thank you for being able to join us. I know you had a busy day and you're pulling yes. it in. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Glad to be here. Dr. James Lee Jr., board certified orthopedic surgeon, practice in Essex County. Proud to be here. Help with any questions that I can uh, assist with. Oh, excellent, excellent. You know, the thing of it is, there was a question that came through with Dr. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Athley, you're you're, you're popular as well. Um, uh, this question is, uh, how do I know that my chest pain is related to my heart and not uh, the uh, heartburn that I usually, uh, uh, that I frequently have? That's an excellent question. I one that we often have to encounter. I would say that you probably do not know, but if there is doubt, you should have it properly checked and evaluated. The chest pain that is secondary to heart is if you think specifically of heart disease that involves the narrowing of the arteries, the coronary arteries, the kind of chest pain that we sometimes associate with heart attacks. If that is the cause of your chest pain, then there's some specifics. The location is what we call retrosternal, generally the middle of the chest. It is more of a squeezing or tightness or heaviness than a sharp or burning pain. And the radiation may be down the left or the right arm and up to the neck. It very seldom radiates below the belly button. It radiates down to the abdomen, but not below the belly button. Um, if you have had a stomach problem before, which has been well-defined, documented to respond to medication, and this is now a different pain, especially if it has some of the characteristics that I mentioned, then you should have it properly evaluated. The evaluation will include a proper physical uh, examination and history taken by a physician, uh, an electrocardiogram, and oftentimes, since the electrocardiogram taken at rest may not show significant abnormalities, even in the presence of severe blockages of the arteries to the heart, then one may require to have other specific tests, such as stress tests of some kind. And the very ultimate, of course, would be a heart catheterization, where tubes are passed into the heart by the, either the arm at the wrist or the groin area. These tubes are passed through the arteries back to the heart, die-injected, and pictures taken 
and based upon the anatomy of the arteries that we see and the degree of blockages that we see, we can go further and recommend treatment at that time. So it, there's, a long, there's a a large gamut of things that can be done, but it was just that the first step is reporting to your physician the specifics of your pains and then having that physician do the appropriate testing to see how far he needs to go to determine the cause or etiology, as we say, of those pains. But it's worthy of evaluation, especially since it's different to the kind of pains you have described as your normal pains from the stomach. Yeah. One of the things that's interesting, as Dr. Jeffrey pointed out, is um, uh, a lot of time we have we have what we call uh, scripts. So uh, there's a classic presentation of what we think a heart attack should be, um, classic presentation for eruption aneurysm, classic presentation for appendicitis. In medicine, patients don't always follow the book. So even, even though we know what the classic presentation is and it's based on the pathophysiology, a lot of times it doesn't happen that way. And it, the only way to tell sometimes is, is after you get evaluated, um, we're able to put other things or consider other factors. Um, there, there are patients who have silent heart attacks. There are patients who have um, ruptured appendicitis who don't have abdominal pain for a week. So there are a lot of things that confound what would be the normal presentation um, where it, unless you're encountering the, the healthcare system, uh, it may be missed. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, not pay attention to some of these things and certainly make sure you see your doctor because there are other factors that they may have to um, consider in, especially in, in specific cases where your presentation even maybe of a heart attack, but it may be a, an atypical presentation. Um, so I would just emphasize that point to make sure that even if, even if you think you're okay, you think it's heartburn, go and see the doctor. <laughs> yeah. If I can add to that, um, as an orthopedic surgeon, I obviously don't deal with heart attacks. However, where I encounter it, when I have a patient who is seeking an elective surgery, such as a joint replacement or maybe a shoulder surgery, we screen the patient. We send them for EKG, blood work, and there's a strong percentage, a high percentage of patients that will come back with an abnormality. And that's sometimes where they're caught. They'll come to the orthopedist saying, oh, my, my shoulder or my knee, my back hurts, you know, please treat it. And then we ended up screening and then we have to, you know, refer them to their primary or the cardiologist. And oftentimes they'll get a further workup. So I think, you know, that's where it's captured sometimes. It's not even what the person was complaining about, but it was screened and was followed up. And I think, you know, it's important to, to follow your symptoms, but sometimes you may not know and it could be silent and then we encounter it in a different type of way. So it's definitely on our radar as well. And um, it's important to, to be screened. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Dr. Lee, not, uh, now that we have you, uh, <laughs> you know I'm going to get you. There's a oh, no problem. That came in and, and, and this is what it stated. I played a lot of basketball when I was young. Now I'm 72 years old. My knees hurt when I walk upstairs. Motrin helps, but what else can, I, can you suggest, suggest? All right. So, you know, when somebody has knee pain, 72 years old, um, I would suggest an evaluation. Um, at that point, if, if the pain is an everyday occurrence and it hurts you every time you go up and down stairs or you get in and out of your car, what we call ADLs or activities of daily living, if it becomes that troublesome, it's worthwhile to, to start with some basic things like an x-ray, okay? What we can do, a common orthopedic surgeon, somebody in the community, they can get alignment x-rays. They have you stand up, get an x-ray of your joints and see if there's any changes. What we look for in an x-ray are bone spurs, if there's narrowing of the space between the thigh bone and the leg bone, the femur and tibia, we can say, hey, listen, it looks like you've developed at some point some arthritis. Now, if the Motrin is not working, I look at it as a treatment ladder. We sort of go up the ladder. Um, globally, we're looking at weight loss, diet, maintaining exercise, but more specifically, if there's a, a specific issue, we say, okay, the Motrin didn't work. Let's look at an alternative. Those alternatives include injections, there's, there's multiple types. There's steroid, which is the most common. There's the quote-unquote cushion or gel shot. 
that is a hyaluronic acid or um, it, it, it's, it's basically a liquid shot, like oil in your engine. You're trying to lubricate the joint. And then more recently, there's biologic shots where we draw your blood and we say, okay, we're going to take the growth factors from your blood and inject it into the knee to sort of freeze the arthritis where it is, prevent some of those enzymes from degrading the knee joint. But I think if it's a continuous issue, you know, definitely some x-rays. And then we go out, look at that treatment ladder, medication, physical therapy, weight loss, sometimes bracing. And if it doesn't work, injections. Excellent. Excellent. Excellent coverage. Um, you know, the thing of it is, is that, um, and, and, and thank you for that. I, I want to go back to uh, dental just for a minute, because we only have a few minutes left. I get to kind of sum, sum, sum up. Some of I, the things. I have a question. I'm oh, sorry. Go to go Dr. I have a question for Dr. Lee. Yes. Hey, Doc. Please. How are you? Good to see you. You too. You too. All right. Um, when we have patients that have had recent joint replacement, in the past, it used to be pre medicate before certain procedures. I know that the, the, the uh, studies have changed. What's the current um, study? You know, what's the current protocol for patients that have had recent joint replacement therapy as it relates to dental treatment? Okay, I would say it, it, this is controversial. If you go to the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery, they likely will say you don't need to treat prophylactically. However, you know, if you're in practice and you get one case of an infected total joint, you know, associated <laughs> with, it's enough to make you change your mind. So I think historically, like you mentioned, if the patient isn't allergic to penicillin, you might give them something like amoxicillin, right. potentially to indomycin. I would say it's a case by case basis. If the patient is high risk, maybe they have comorbidities, they're diabetic. Um, if there's any potential complicating factor, or if you feel that your whatever type of intervention you're doing in the oral cavity is going to be invasive, then I think it's appropriate to consider prophylactic you know, medication. But based on studies, it is controversial, and the guidelines will say, "Oh no, you don't have to do it." But um, I would examine on a case by case basis. Anyone who's high risk, I would certainly consider it. Yeah, we, we've still been doing it for that very reason. It only yeah. takes one case. Right, exactly, exactly. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, yeah, it, it's basically, uh, this, has been, this has been an awesome, awesome two hours with Dr. Rosemont, but I want you to just sum up on some of the highlights that you think that we should leave the people with as far as dental concern, de dentistry is concerned. Um, Boy, just, just touch on a few bases that you think are important for our population. I would say, as, as stated by a lot of the doctors here, it's important to get regular assessments. Don't avoid, you know, you shouldn't wait till something's uncomfortable. Catch things early. We just, everybody's discussed it in different ways in their different specialties. Get regular assessments. Um, a lot of old thinking is, is not what's really currently going on. Um, I would say for children, get the children assessed early, as early as one year old, one, one year old, to uh, to develop good oral habits, to break bad dietary habits, uh, to assess things like how how they're developing. Do they have tongue ties? Do they have you know any um, developmental issues? And try to catch those early. And for our mature patients, don't neglect. And don't have the assumption that as I mature, I should lose teeth because that's inaccurate. We should get regular assessments, regular cleanings, um, and stay healthy. And remember that no matter how well you live a lifestyle, the oral environment is the last thing that food hits before it enters your body. So keep it as healthy as possible. Excellent. Excellent. You Thank know, there's some other questions coming in. I, and, and it's, I, it, Go ahead. Someone? I have one. Can Go ahead. Rosemont summarize the different types of dentists? Oh, you know, when, so, I ask, when so, I see patients who goes to what dentist, what <laughs> specialty? Good, good, very good question. So in dentistry, we have multiple specialties, i.e. as medicine. I would say just like a primary care physician, you know, initially start with your general dentist. Let, let the general dentist make the assessment. And if it needs to go to any um, specialist for further and more uh, involved therapies and treatment, then he or she would be the quarterback. But we have pediatric dentistry, we have oral surgery, we have prostodontics, we have endodontics. Uh, what do those doctors do? Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> let me know. Pedi pediatrics, 
Pediatric yes. is obviously pretty self-explanatory. Yes. They, they deal with children as well as adults with developmental challenges. Um, all surgeons deal with uh, such things as fractures, tumors, uh, reconstruction. Uh, general dentistry tends to deal with all aspects of dentistry to a certain level based on their, level, their, their training. Uh, endodontists uh, specialize in what we call root canal treatments and, and therapies of the, the nerve, nerve canals in the teeth. Uh, who did I forget? Um, Perio. Perio. Perio is a big, big thing. They deal with the supporting structure of the teeth, the bone and the gums. And they, they're very involved nowadays also in placement of implants. So surgeons place implants, periodontists place implants. Um, very, very important, particularly in our community, because periodontal disease is probably the most prevalent oral disease that we have right now. So periodontists. Um, and that's and that's that's of the gums, right? That's the gum, gums and bone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I know I'm forgetting somebody. Uh, let's see. Then, you know, we do have other other components like public health. Um, How about the doctor I, with the braces? Orthodontist, thank you. Thank you. I know I was getting some. <laughs> orthodontist that, that obviously <laughs> movement of the teeth via either traditional braces or clear line of therapy. And then we also have the same thing, public health, academic dentistry, military dentistry, all those things. Mm -hmm. And don't forget if if you're in a situation where you cannot afford your dentist dental care, please seek out one of the federally qualified health centers. They um, they really do a good job. And the one that's in Essex County is Newark Community Health Center. That is Newark Community Health Center. Please seek them out. They do an excellent job. And if you cannot pay, believe it or not, they will not turn you away. No, they will not turn you away. Kevin? Oh, one more quick question. Uh, do we have another seminar in October before we leave? Uh, yes, we do. Okay. And, and guess what? Guess who is uh, Dr. Court? <laughs> highlighting that one? <laughs> That's cool. Dr. Kevin Clark. You. <laughs> you. October, uh, Kevin, October is breast cancer month. Okay. So mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm going to be asking and requesting that you highlight that and let's talk about it, man. Yeah, I think it's something so important uh, that we want to bring that in October. Okay. Um, That's going to mention uh, since if it wasn't if we didn't have one, just to mention the the mission, maybe Dr. Court can mention. Uh, they were going to Guyana. Oh yeah, uh, actually, yeah. We have that covered. Oh, you yeah, got to that's co that, that oh. is covered. We're we're going uh, to December. And I, and I will I will preface that since you brought it up. Uh, our December, we what we will what we're planning is for our December webinar to um, highlight our like our experience in Guyana with the Guyana Medical Mission going over to helping and and treating patients in Guyana with Dr. James Court, our fearless leader. All righty. So um, what I'd like to do is there are a few questions that we can answer quickly so, to, so we don't leave anyone out. Um, let me try the first one here. Are the doctors on the panel for, cons for consults? Huh. If so, can you provide name, specialties, <laughs> address, and contact information uh, on your website? So what we can do, and, and just to let anybody know out there, take your name and just Google us up. We come up, believe me. Uh, just say New Jersey, Dr. Omar Bay, New Jersey. I'll come up. My officer, we will come up where we are and how to contact us. And that's very easy to do. Um, on the website, uh, we will try to put more information about our physicians on the website so it'll be easy to contact them. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, do you believe acupuncture can help minimize uh, pains in the knees, Dr. Dr. Lee? Yeah, I think so. Um, it is an alternative treatment. Acupuncture is when there's needling performed. And the, the idea is that there's centers of pain that have, are stimulated in such a way with the needle that they can decrease inflammation, decrease pain. Uh, anecdotally, I have quite a few of my patients uh, who go this route and, and seem to be happy with it. I look at it as um, an additive treatment. If, if either the individual isn't interested in medication Maybe they're brittle diabetic and they can't get an injection or there's some type of metabolic disorder. I do believe acupuncture is a great alternative. All righty. 
Well, thank you, each and every one of you, for coming and you know just bestowing your knowledge. Thank you, Dr. Rosemont. Of course, you were excellent, and you know you weren't going to be anyway. So <laughs> that's a given, brother. That's a given. You do it. You do well, it. I just like to thank you for uh, inviting me, and this is an amazing group. And you know, continue to do, do the good work that you guys do. Thank you. Right. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, um, in closing, um, I would like to thank OB Healthy for allowing us to bring this webinar to you because it, without them, we couldn't bring this webinar. Every second Saturday, you no, know, just tell everybody that we're going to be here. They can go into OB Healthy and just click and, you know, hit Physicians Network and. We're here to answer their medical questions every second Saturday at one o'clock every month. It's all about sharing and caring. So that's what we believe. And I think that's what our community should believe. So let's take care of each other. The most important thing I'm gonna say, and I always say it, do not change any aspect of your medical care until you consult your physician as well as your dentist because only they can truly take care of your health. All righty. If you've missed any of our webinars, you can go to OB Healthy and just scroll down off the, off the um, homepage down to the bottom and you will see the YouTube sign. Just click on it and all our YouTube um, and, and webinars are right there. Uh, please subscribe so we can continue to bring this to you. All righty, until next month, and uh, next month, as we stated, we're going to have Dr. Kevin Clark and he is our surgical oncologist, of course, and we will be talking about breast cancer. And that's a topic that's, you know, that's so important out there. And we're going to get in detail with that. All righty. Thank you very much. And until next month, I'm going to say peace. Peace to everyone and enjoy. We'll see you next month. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.